my name is Françoise Mouly and I am the art editor of The New Yorker as well as the editorial director of Toon Books. In uh, 1980, when I started uh, Raw magazine, um, it was the opposite of the way the world is today. Comics were seen as this low-brow low entertainment uh, with uh, no respectability whatsoever. Uh, they would pervert the mind of children or adults, uh, and they certainly were not acknowledged as a medium for serious uh, art or literature or discussion. So I created a magazine with my husband, Art Spiegelman, was a cartoonist um, that was intending to change a perception for comics. Art came from a milieu in San Francisco of underground comics where Robert Crumb was the leader of that field and a lot of the work was trying to break taboos about sex and drugs and um, different lifestyle. Uh, that's not what Raw Magazine um, was trying to do. A lot of the underground comics were sold mainly through uh, head shops, together with hash pipes and all the other paraphernalia. Uh, with Raw Magazine, we were doing some things that I distributed in bookstores. Um, legitimate bookstores for the most part and what we wanted, we, we chose a large size well-printed magazine um, so that it would give a kind of frame of um, appreciation uh, closer to that given to art and literature. Uh, when I first uh, got interested in comics, at the time I was studying architecture and I discovered um, comics as a medium through uh, listening to art, who was uh, courting me by reading me Little Nemo and uh, Crazy Cat by George Harriman, which is really very effective, um, it's wonderful. But um, when we would go into a comic shop, I really felt like it was a Times Square. At the time, it was like a porno shop. It just reeked of like, um, testosterone and uh, adolescent male sensibility dominated by uh, superhero comics with big busted women being tied to like uh, ship's masts or whatever it was. I remember being in a comic shop with my son, with my 10 year old son, um, and he put his hand over my eyes. He was, he was embarrassed about me seeing the comics that were at Forbidden Planet. Um, he didn't know, poor kid, uh, that I had been in many Forbidden Planets in my life. Um, nowadays, we are actually about to celebrate the 30th anniversary of uh, Raw Magazine, and it's a world upside down. Uh, comics are actually dubbed by a euphemistic label of graphic novel, uh, which became a big deal. When we published Raw, we included chapters of Mouse because there was no other way. Art was working on it at the time. It took 13 years for him to do the book and there was no way to publish this with a mainstream publisher. So we did it in our magazine. Eventually it came out as a book from Pantheon with no expectation of it ever reaching a mainstream audience and it exploded. Uh, into an extraordinary like reception, Pulitzer Prize, museum shows, uh, show at the MoMA in 1991. I mean, all those things were unprecedented and they opened the field for a lot more serious comics. Uh, many of the people that we had published in Raw, such as Chris Ware or Charles Burns or um, Suko became artists recognized in their own fund publishers. And the reason it's a world upside down now is that at the time we were saying comics are not just for kids anymore. And now in um, 2010, we're seeing comics or graphic novels uh, accepted in museums and in bookstores, but not um, widely available for children. So I now feel that I have a moral duty um, to course correct and say, wait a minute, it's not just for adults. Um.
Um, the reason I uh, started uh, to do comics for kids, the real reason is because it worked for me. Um, when my children were young, uh, there's a point where they were in uh, first grade and they were told, oh, by April you, you have to know how to read. And it worked for my daughter, but with my son, um, same, I mean, same environment, very bright kid. We had always read to him, uh, loved being read to, but the little light bulb that goes on that makes him a fluent reader, it just took much longer. And since my husband was reading American literature, uh, I, I always spoke French to my kids, so I was reading in French. We needed something that would sustain his interest. And lo and behold, it turns out that the culture I come from, French comics, has marvelous offerings for young kids. Not just Tintin and Astérix, but um, Boulet Bill, uh, just, just hundreds of really great kids' comics. So every night it was a pleasure. And the reason why a kid who loves being read to, will pay attention to the comics uh, better than he would to uh, an illustrated text, is that there is something for him or her to follow on the page. There's a visual flow, there's a visual narrative that is implicitly understandable, even when you don't understand the words. And in a good comic, um, and they're hard to find, but good comics have parallel intertwined narratives. It's not just picture, repetition in the words. There's a lot of information that is communicated visually, and it's a perfect point of entry. Um, what we've been saying is that comics are a gateway into um, literature. It's a great time to uh, discover comics, graphic novel, because there's so many uh, really good books. Joe Sacco's book um, just got published. Book. Uh, it's a great book. Um, it got published at the end of the year, so it hasn't quite gotten um, the full recognition that it deserves. Last year, Asterios Polyp um, by David Mazzucchelli, who we published in a row many years ago, but uh, also spent like 10 or 15 years working on that book and now um, has it out, and that's terrific. Um, Bob Sikoriak, R. Sikoriak, who used to be um, one of our assistant editor at Raw Magazine, just published uh, Masterpiece Comics, um, also I think from Daron and Quadley. That's a beautiful book. In a month or two, uh, Daron and Quadley will release a new book by Dan Klaus. Um, that's fantastic. Um, Art published a re edition of Breakdowns with some new material um, that's um, really interesting. I think um, totally objectively, even though I'm married to the man, but it's uh, both the experimental strips that he did in the 70s and uh, strips that he just did that actually looks back on um, uh, both growing up and little anecdotes about his childhood and the kind of thinking um, that was breakthrough uh, thinking then was the, um, what, what unlocked the possibilities for mouse and now being recombined for um, uh, narrative. Um, those, those, those moments are very exciting because um, mouse was a memoir and it was black and white, uh, completely different from anything that had existed uh, since then. Um, it gave way to books such as Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi, an uh, Iranian young woman who came to Vienna and then to France and did a memoir about growing up in Iran. Um, and that got turned into a movie. Um, um, all of those books are books that have um, taken a long time to mature. I think Joe Sacco spent like five years only on his um, Gaza, uh, Footnotes in Gaza book. So now they are coming out one at a time and they each deserve a lot of, they're great. For somebody who's coming into comics now, um, those uh, volumes are so rich in uh, visual ideas in storytelling and the very mature works. 
I'm the art editor, so um, I have taken over, I'm a, a, I think, the fourth art editor in 85 years of the magazine's history. The first art editor was Ree Irvin, and uh, we will soon celebrate uh, the 85th anniversary of The New Yorker. And when the magazine was created, it was uh, part of the reason why uh, it was so good and so exciting is that it was meant as a humor magazine where the artists were an integral part of the magazine so that they were so the drawings were not just like those throw, throw pillows to decorate the big gray sea of type but a lot of the uh, immediacy and cattiness and the Algonquin round table feeling of the magazine came from the artists and the cartoons. That's my job, is to actually work with the artists that are full-fledged contributors. So I'm also not taking care of the photographers or the illustrators, the ones that are actually like um, illustrating somebody else's text piece. But I work with Bruce McCall or with Dan Klaus or with Art Spiegelman or with Robert Crumb when we publish strips inside and another place where it's totally just like it was in 1925 for the entire 85 year history is a cover of the magazine that retains that spirit. It's done by an artist. It's not an illustration of something that's inside. It's autonomous and the story is given by the artist. And that's different from any other uh, monthly or weekly publication that is left in this uh, media age. If you're talking about the cover of Newsweek, it will be often a photo, most often a photo, but an illustration of whatever the editorial um, uh, group will have decided should be the cover story that week. Uh, at The New Yorker, it's not, it's actually um, an artist who has sent in a sketch done very simply, pen on paper, and that's his idea. So we have uh, for this week's cover um, uh, a four panel cartoon by uh, Barry Blitt um, of a uh, figure walking on water. And then by this panel, we see that it's Barack Obama. And by that panel, uh, first year anniversary, we see him sink through um, into the water. This isn't the editorial comment. It's not the cover story. It's not necessarily linked to anything. But it's the artist as a uh, lightning rod. He catches what's in the air. I think this talks about our disappointment, our failed expectation. We thought um, that Barack Obama could walk on water, but it's also signed by Barry Blitz. So even though it's a New Yorker cover, it has this privileged place of being an individual's point of view. And that gives it um, a lot of, um, importance, I think, in the culture. This image by Barry Blitt of um, Barack Obama and um, Michelle in the White House uh, with him dressed as a terrorist, her dressed as an Angela Davis character, a flag burning in the chimney, a uh, portrait of bin Laden on the wall, um, is an image I'm extremely proud of. Um, it's been labeled by the New York Times as the most memorable image of the 2008 campaign. And I think that's true. I think that image actually um, crystallized what was going on in the summer. It came out in uh, July of 2008, crystallized the forces that were at work. This is what uh, Barack Obama was up against uh, when he was running. And this gives us a, a way to measure the depth of his victory when he got himself elected. Um, was I surprised? I was taken aback um, because 
everybody, and there were thousands and tens of thousands of people who took objection to this image. And what they all said to one person, they said, I get it, I personally understand it, but I'm worried about my sister-in-law, I'm worried about my mother, I'm worried about people in Arkansas. We wrote back and said, we get it, you know, we, we're able to like uh, follow through. They were all worried about somebody else not getting it, even though they all acknowledged like, you know, I'm sophisticated. I'm, and, and this is a symptom. I think like, you know, the school counselor will tell you that when you have a child coming in and saying like, well, I'd like to talk about, you know, my friend who um, uh, is encountering this and that problem. It's some way of trying to express their uh, ambivalent feeling about uh, that, they, that they just do not know how to express. So I think of this image as having been exactly um, the right thing at the right time. It became a catalyst. It lent the boils. It was poison that was um, uh, really um, making the body politics sick because there were innuendos about he's a Muslim, he's, um, he's not American. All of this stuff was there, but nobody dared talk about it. And that's how the Fox News of this world and the um, Carl Wolf of this world exploded the decency of people of not daring uh, to talk about the ambivalence and what it really meant to have a black man run for president. And by not talking, it was um, a much worse sin that once this image happened under the world, it exploded all this. I felt of it as, I thought of it as some kind of Again, lancing of a boil, uh, vaccination, you put a little bit of the poison, but in some controlled manner because it was a discussion. And I contend that uh, talking about something is always better than not talking about something. Like a long time ago, we published an image of a young woman getting uh, married and she's getting all ready for her um, uh, wedding day. And lo and behold, she has a big belly and she is um, uh, pregnant. And then we got a letter from somebody, um, lady saying like, oh my God, I'm so shocked by this image. I have a teenage daughter and I had to hide my copy of The New Yorker because I was afraid she would see it. Um, as if we were advocating um, that all pregnant women should be married, as if it was some kind of recruitment poster for um, having the baby first and getting married after. But I, I don't respond. Um, and, but if I could have, if I, if I had a chance, I would have gotten back to the sweeter and I would have said, Lady, if you are that concerned about um, your daughter getting pregnant and not being married, then you should actually tape the cover of the New Yorker on the door of her bedroom and you should talk to her about it. Hiding the image is not going to accomplish. You, you should actually use it as a point of, um, as, a, as a departing point for discussion. His 85th anniversary for a magazine started in 1925 um, by Ray Irvin. Um, the first image was used to still, it was a mascot, was this image that became the mascot of the New Yorker. And even when I came in, I've been there 16 years, there was a tradition of running that image every year for February um, for the anniversary issue. And now we've started playing with that. And this year, um, it's very exciting because I got four different artists. We have four different covers on the magazine. Uh, what, what is really exciting to me is that once again, uh, using the means of mass reproduction, um, this is just a regular piece of paper printed as the cover of the magazine. The depth of ideas and content and um, uh, allusions to each other's image and we worked all together as a kind of like uh, 
rolling ball consortium, um, uh, exchanging ideas, where each image is individually um, understandable, but they also, when you see all of them, um, you can make the connection between them. That is one of the things that uh, um, I find very exciting about print, um, as opposed to movie making or animation or any of the other visual medium, is that the reader has the time to spend uh, with any one image and find the layers and layers. You can actually, it doesn't just flash at 24 frames a second. It just is held there however long you want to spend on it. So many of the images that I work on have different layers of reading. Even the children's books um, can have, can be seen at first glance, you read them once, and then you get um, the story, the story juice out of it. But then most children actually, when they really get into books, reread them, and they are phenomenally apt readers. They really know how to read a book over and over again, and they get all of the embedded like things in the background, because it's a laborious art to, um, to draw by hand and to be a cartoonist. You spend so many hours at your drawing table, you can't help putting a lot of yourself into the image. And when it's printed, the reader can spend hours getting it out.